welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Let's get into the word. Would you stand with me and let's honor the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Father God, we're so grateful that we get the opportunity to be in this house, Lord. This is a good house. This is a house you built, Father. You put in San Bernardino almost 25 years ago so that the word of God may be taught, may be exalted, Lord God, that your name be present in our midst. So we're grateful that this group of people and others online, Father, are hearing this message in this moment and are about to get something tremendous from your word. Thank you so much for teaching us, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher of the church. You use men and women to communicate your word, but you truly teach us. Father God, your word teaches that the word is the seed and our heart is the ground. So we pray that our heart may be good ground tonight to receive what you have for us and it will give us great fruit in our own life, Father, this very night. Father God, just as we, you're blessing us here at The Rock, we pray a blessing over all the churches around the Inland Empire and in the world. Father, we pray a blessing over them. We don't consider ourselves better than any church, Lord. We are co laborers with them, advancing one kingdom that's yours alone. We always say it, and we believe it, and we all say in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. You know, a while back, I... I received kind of the word I'm, I'm sharing with you tonight, but it is something that's been in my heart now present in my own life. And I'm going to talk about, uh, it's going to sound kind of funny, the title, but I'm going to talk about something called the power of transition, the power of transition. And it's so important for you and I because we're all in transition in some place in our lives. I know my wife and I are going through several transitions within our families. For the first time, we have uh, two kids, full-time school, and a little girl coming along, and, and different stages, and so a heavier involvement in ministry than we ever had. So there's always, and we're always evolving into something. There's a transition in our life. Our own country right now, and our world's going through political transition, economical transition, social transition. We have, um, you know, we have the younger generation coming up, the older generation retiring. That whole process right there is bringing a different transition into what's going on. So we're always in the process of transition. But more than ever before, in this next few months, we're living a tough transition. Even political, many people are making decisions based on who's going to win and, and who's going to do this and who are you voting for and where's the country going. And so this process of transition is constantly in the minds and the hearts of people. So for all of us, transitions are stages that are very, very real. The problem is that transitions are often, often misunderstood and underestimated and undervalued. And so people miss it. But it's very important that transitions be placed in our own lives and for the seasons of life. Even older people, sometimes people don't want to get old, especially in California. I mean, we're the capital of plastic surgery. So, uh, and so it's, we don't want to, but the Bible says that the beauty of the older person is its wisdom. It's wisdom. So even in that transition, there's a beautiful thing. But if we miss the process, if we hang on to one thing and don't go on to the next, or if we run too fast to the next without understanding the previous, we miss the transition. And the transition is so crucial for us to get everything that God has for us. A dictionary definition for you says, a transition is an event that results in transformation. A transition is an event that results in a transformation. A transition is the connection between two events. Here's another one. Transition is the process that connects the ending of something to the beginning of a new thing. Transition connects the ending of something to the beginning of a new thing. And that's so crucial for all of us. Most of us are ending some stage in our life, moving on to something new in our life, whether it be good or bad. They're transitions. They're seasons of life. And we have to learn to embrace them all. Embrace them all. See, a lot of people fear certain things in their life, but all of it, everything that we go through is what makes us who we are. Did you hear what I just said? Everything that we go through is what makes us who we are. Now, even though it makes what we are, doesn't determine the end of it. That's in God's hand. That's in his future. We're holding on to something great. And that's where people lose. They're thinking, I'm going through all of this, so I'm going to become it. Oh, no, 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 no. You're a new creation. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. There's an understanding in God's hand. But just because you're going through something, you should reject it. 
You shouldn't reject it because transitions are going to help us in everything we do. And today I want to look at a very, very famous transition. As a matter of fact, Pastor Jim taught us a phenomenal message on this particular scripture. And God brought me back to it and was showing me something a little different. And it's a transition between Elijah and Elisha. Once again, two prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. What I want you to do, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to open if you have a little ribbon, in 2 Kings 2, and you put that little ribbon in 2 Kings chapter 2. But we're not going to start there. We're going to start in 1 Kings 19. So mark 2 Kings chapter 2, mark your ribbon, but go to 1 Kings 19. Let me give you a little bit of the background so we can understand what we're talking about. Elijah was the prophet of the time. There was no prophet like Elijah. This guy was amazing, doing miracles that were unbelievable. As a matter of fact, he's so important that when in the transfiguration, when Jesus was there, it said that Elijah was there. And so people associated in the New Testament, always great prophets with the spirit of Elijah. Not the spirit of Elisha. So this man was important. This man was crucial. See, many people tend to down Elijah because he messed up in the end of his life. But that doesn't make them any less powerful, important, or dynamic to a spiritual importance. So here's what's going on. Elijah's, you know, the story. There's a lady named Jezebel. This lady's crazy, crazy, crazy. Has a bunch of prophets to a bat, a Baal God. And so he says, you know what? I'm going to show you that God is a true God. And so he said, call all your prophets, 450 of them. We're going to meet and we're going to break out a duel. We'll see who's the real God, my God or yours. So, you know, the story, they go out, set up a big um, bonfire type of deal, big altar, put a, you know, a cow up there, bunch of water. Um, and so they don't put the water yet, but they have all that stuff. Then all these guys, 450, all day long, oh, God, come and burn the offering, throw fire, bring, consume the, nothing. Elijah's making fun of them. Hey, shout louder. Maybe the guy's taking a nap. And, I mean, he's just going, you know, making fun of them. So the guys are cutting themselves. Nothing happened. Elijah says, I got this. It's my time, you know? So he says, move away. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm going to make it even harder. I'm going to triple, double dare you, okay? Or does that make sense, triple, double dare? Uh, whatever. But see, so he said, I'm going to dare you. So he just pours, says, fill it up with water. Just put water there. Just fill it up, make it wet. He prays to God, and all of a sudden, fire comes down and consumes everything, the water, the wood. I mean, everything was gone. Bam. And so he showed the part of God done deal so elijah takes all these guys out and cuts their heads off they're dead that was a deal i'm going to show how powerful god is well jessica finds out and says send some millet and finds out you think you're tough i'm paraphrasing this is the paul version so hey you you, you think you're tough i'm going to chase you down and if i mean if my name is not jessica you're dead by tomorrow noon okay then all of a sudden, something changes in Elijah. Here's a man who took on 450 guys and proved that God was more powerful, killed them all, and one lady says, I'm going to kill you by tomorrow, and he's running. I mean, he's running, literally. He's gone. He's depressed. He runs out to the desert, you know, sits on a tree. Lord, I, all I want to do is I, I just want to die. I'm done with ministry. A lot of pastors prayed on Monday, but that's no here nor there. But... <laughs> So Elijah's just going off on God. He's saying, oh, my goodness, I'm going through this process. This is so, this is so tough. So he keeps going out to the desert. And uh, God calls him and said, meet with me. So God meets with him. And you guys already know the story. God speaks to him in that still, small voice. But here's what God told him. says, Elijah, here's what happens. You're done. You're done. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go on your way, and I want you to do three things. I want you to anoint a king, anoint a general, and I want you to anoint a guy named Elisha. And Elisha is going to take your job as the prophet. And then the Lord says, if somebody escapes the hand of the king, then the general will kill him. If somebody escapes the hand of the general, Elisha will kill him. God knew that there was something in the heart of Elisha that he was not going to back down for nobody or for anything because he was going to honor God in every way. Are you with me? So here's a transition and why transitions are important. How to understand your transition. How to understand your transition. If you're in a transition time in your life, these are a few things that God showed me that will help you go through your process of transition in life. You're saying, Pastor, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not moving anywhere. Write it down because you will go through it eventually. Believe me. Number one, transition starts 
in your current place. Transition stars in your current place. I am a point A to point B kind of guy. I think most guys are. And now that I'm, you know, getting a little older, my kids are a little older, not so much, but when my kids were smaller, and my in-laws live in Las Vegas, so from time to time we will go visit them so they can see the grandkids. It was, for me, it was just, hey, load up the car, sit there, bring a bunch of food, because I'm driving from San Bernardino to Las Vegas, nonstop flight. Nobody move, nobody cry, okay? <laughs> and so, how many men can relate? Just me? Liars. <laughs> point A to point B, man. I don't want to stop. I just want to get the mission done. Let's go. But I had to learn through my wife, hey, the kids don't have the same tolerance you have. They, they have to walk around, and they have to eat, and they have to stretch and get back in. And so what used to be you know, a three-and-a-half-hour drive now becomes a five-hour drive with two stops, 50 McDonald's, and $100 from here to there, you know? <laughs> So, so that was a transition in our life, getting kids and learning to work with them and going in the process from point A to point B. But every transition starts in your place. There's a place, a beginning of your transition. Here's where we go. Go to 1 Kings and 19, 19. 1 Kings 19, 19. It says this. So he departed from, for he departed from there, meaning from the meeting with God, Elisha did, and he found, Elijah did, I'm sorry, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. To most people, we'll look at that verse and say, oh, that's an interesting story. Pastor Jim broke that verse down amazingly. Number one, you have to notice, Pastor Jim taught us this, that Elisha was a rich kid. Because in, in those times, to have one ox, one was a pile of money. His dad had 12 pairs of them. Very rich. And he happened to be working in the field with everyone else, tending his father's business. See, a lot of people miss transition because they're so focused in the future and ignore their present and they're tugging them to their past. And that's not how it works. You have to look at the future because that keeps you excited, but you cannot ignore your present or you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. Elisha wasn't in his house sitting, you know, and Elijah went and knocked down, let's have some tea, let me give him my mantle. None of that. This guy was a proven worker. He was at his job, helping his family, doing what he had to do. Don't miss your transition because your transition is going to start in your current place, in your job, in your family, in what you do. That's where it goes. You have to look at it as important. You have to look at it as important. You cannot move to your next step until this current step becomes very crucial to you. And to Elisha, he was there investing. He was there doing what he needed to do in his present job. And Elijah threw his mantle on him. That's so important because the mantle in the times of the Bible was the clothing that represented a prophet. So people dress in what they did. You know, a doctor nowadays has a, a, a white coat and so um, different things. So it's represented in the same manner. And it also possessed, they can do things with the anointing of God. Remember Moses had the rod and he hit the water and he did a lot of miracles with it. In the same manner. So Elijah takes it off and puts it on, Elijah takes it off, puts it on Elijah saying, hey, you're the next guy. You have now my clothing. And it's so crucial because it started where? In that place. Started in that job. And you and I cannot miss that. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're bored with your job or frustrated in your position. Or you're a stay-at-home mom all day and I want to do something important for life. You have to focus and say, this is what's important right now. This is what's important right now. It's so crucial. Let me tell you. I think I've shared this with you, but... When I, I was in the dental field, and so when I worked in Las Vegas, I, I, I managed one of the offices or the back office, all the clinical stuff. And I remember when God called us to come out here, I said, okay, Lord, we'll do it. And so we joined Dr. Barron's ministry, ISOM, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting back in ministry from the professional world, and I'm getting this. So I get to ISOM, I'm excited, I'm going to have a job in ministry. I get there, and so Barron says, well, you know, we're still working on your position, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to translate from time to time, but you're also going to be the secretary because we don't have anyone to pick up the phones. Uh, come again? Uh, believe me, 
my level of, uh, of humility and humbleness went very, very low. I had no pride left. But it taught me something so interesting because for many years prior to that, I worked in customer service also, and I was terrible. Believe me, I was not this kind. God had to work on me. I hated customer service. I don't know if you ever worked in customer service, or if you do, I'm right there with you. I'll be praying for you tonight and every day <laughs> because... It was so hard to work customer service. I mean, you felt attacked. You didn't do anything. You're just there to kind of help them out, but they hate you. You represent the company. So when you call somebody, have mercy on them, okay, sometimes. Um, but that taught me to deal with people in a different manner. See, and then it went from there to ministry, and then it went from there to what I do today. But every transition started right where I was at and where I was taught me something, something. If I would have gone from the dental practice from who I was straight into ministry, I would have probably beaten a lot of people up because I, I didn't want it because I was used to being served. I was the boss. I was the guy who called the shots. And all of a sudden, I'm not in that position anymore. Why? Every stage brings a transition, but it starts in your current process. Starts there. I read a story of a man who um, there's, it's being told in different ways, but this man was driving in a San Francisco area and was about to hit the toll booth, and there's a big old line rush out, everybody hunking the horn, and in his line, he's two cars behind the booth, and the guy in the booth is blaring rock and roll and dancing, woo, da -na 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 -na. I mean, just going off, and this guy's in his car thinking, this guy's crazy? I mean, it's rush hour, everybody's hunking their horn, why is he playing rock and dancing? Finally makes it, and he's like, look, man, here's the money, I can't hold it, but ask you, why in the world are you playing rock and roll and dancing in, in rush hour? People are screaming at you. said, man, I'm having a party. And he's dancing. And he said, well, none of your friends are. Well, they're not invited to my party. I don't care. You know, he's all excited. And, and he said, wow, that's so interesting. So he leaves. And this guy is a famous author. So he said he was so compelled by this man's story that he decided to try to track him. So he went through the toll several times. Finally, a month later, lands in the line of the same guy. And the same thing happens. Rock and roll, the guy's dancing away. So he's like, I want to ask him this time. So he drives up, drives up and says, okay, man, you probably don't remember me a month ago. I asked you, you told me you're having a party. I see you still going at it. But why? How come you're having fun and no one else of these workers are having fun? He said, it's all a matter of what you think. He said, I have a dream. I want to be a dancer. But they don't pay me enough to go to dance school. So you know what I do? I practice writing here. My bosses pay me to learn to dance. He understood his transition. He understood, man, this is what I got. I'm going to make the best of it with what I got. I'm going to work with what I've been giving. And many of us need to get that mentality because our transition starts right in our current place, like, just like it did with Elijah. With Elijah, sorry. Do your job. Look to God. Do your job. Look to God. See, David was working in the field when he was anointed by Samuel. Peter. And his brothers were fishing when Jesus called them. Matthew was working at the door, collecting taxes when Jesus called them. None of these guys were home watching TV. None. Well, they didn't have TVs, but nonetheless. <laughs> what I mean is they just went sitting around. They were in their current jobs, in their current life, and God reached out to them and said, come, I got something for you. So please don't ignore where you're at for your transition. Are you with me? Number two, number two, transition is not motionless. Transition is not motionless. A lot of people consider transition that, oh my goodness, I'm in this in-between stage and I'm just, I'm stuck. That's the expression. I've used it many times. You've used it. The transition point, we feel stuck. We feel, I, I can't go back because that's, that's horrible and I, I'm ready for my future, but I can't get there fast enough. So I feel stuck. But transition is so important because transition is not motionless. I remember, not this Olympic, but last Olympics, I was watching the 400-meter um, relay, the 4x100 and the 4x400-meter relay. And it was so interesting because I'm watching this, this race, and these guys run super fast. You've seen them. You probably saw them this year. But I noticed something that was so crucial. In the most important part to the relay race is the transition of the baton. The most important part is actually the transition because all those guys can run fast. But if you drop the baton, you're done. You're done. So the most important part of the transition is 
How do I get the baton? Actually, I noticed something. The guy that's about to get it doesn't even look back. They're trusting this guy to give him the right time so he can move on to his future. And transition is just that same way. You just put your hand out there and keep doing your thing until somebody hands you your next step, your next level, what you're doing. But you gotta hold on to it. And we'll, we'll look at it how um, Elisha understood that and started looking at it as because it's not motionless. It's an important part of the transition. First Kings 19, you're right there, 20 and 21, reads like this. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Understood? I mean, that sounds logical. He's saying, I, I get what you're saying. You gave me your mantle. You want me to follow you, but let me just say bye to my mom and dad. And he said to him, Hey, go back, for what have I done to you? That sounds almost cruel. Elijah says, do what you want to do. I didn't do anything. I gave you my shirt, man. Enjoy. Verse 21, so Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled, them fle and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and he became his servant. Now these two verses are crazy, okay? Let's try to send Bernardino eyes, okay? Here's what's going on. Elisha says, hey, I get it. You're giving me a new job. I know it's an assignment from God. Let me run and tell my mom and dad and I'm, I'm with you. I mean, he's committed to going. I'm with you. And Elijah says, do whatever you want, man. I'm going to keep going down my road. And all of a sudden, the next verse says, Elisha turned around, killed the two oxen, served it up for dinner, and said, let's go. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's crazy. I don't know if it's crazy. It sounds crazy to me, you know. But there's something in Elisha that he says, I cannot be motionless. Somebody's doing, God is calling me. God is asking me to do something. Regardless of what's going on behind me, this is where I'm heading. See, he understood the transition. And many of us, many times, miss out on the transition because we want to have everything perfect. Everything perfect. I remember I had a friend who didn't want to get married for the longest time. And uh, he loved his girlfriend and fiancé, but he, this guy was so organized, everything was in order, and he had told himself he needed a certain amount of money before he could marry. And, I mean, he was working hard for that certain amount of money, and everything was great, but things kept getting delayed. And the girl's not digging the transition in this case. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> because the wedding is not happening, and the money's not coming in the way you plan, and things don't happen. Sometimes you need to understand when to grab it. And Elisha knew this is the time to grab it. I cannot be motionless. I cannot expect my future to line up completely before I jump into the process. Are you with me? Because it hardly ever does. It hardly ever does. And so um, finally my friend got a good head on his shoulder and got married and they have two beautiful kids. So I'm glad they did that. But what I'm saying is a lot of times we want to plan it out that way. Jesus was talking to a bunch of guys, especially the disciples, and, uh, and he said this to them in, in a response because they were saying, hey, let me go with you. When God was saying, I'm going to go with you, but let me go tell my mom and dad. And Jesus said, hey, go do your thing. And one guy said, oh, I want to go with you, but I need to arrange some business. Jesus says, go with you. Then he turns around and says this. I'm going to read the, me the message Bible, Luke 9, 62. I'll put it up for you. It says, Jesus said, no procrastination. No backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Seize the day. And so for all of us, that's the famous expression of, hey, you can't put your hand to the plow and look back. You're not fit for the kingdom. But the message says, no procrastination. Don't put it away. No backward looks. No, you know, if I do this, then I'll be able to do this. If I do that, then I'll be able to do this. When it's your time, it's your time. And you have to be ready. That's why transition is so crucial. Because you invest in the transition so you're ready for the moment. You have to be ready for the moment. As a matter of fact, I read a, a, an article that a lot of people in this economical time, which is a transition point, have taken this time to do what? Go back to school. They're understanding, man, I'm not where I was at before, but I want to be at a different place. So in this transition time, I'm going to make an investment. I'm not going to stay motionless. I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to develop something new. I'm going to grow inside of me. I'm going to invest in God. I'm going to do something. I remember when I was young, 
a much younger teenager, I remember telling my pastor, oh, when, I, when I'm a pastor, when I'm in ministry, I'm going to pray a lot. I'm going to read the Bible. His words, he said, if you don't do it now, you're not going to have time to do it then. If you don't do it now, you're not going to have time to do it then. You hear what I'm saying? Many times we're saying, when I'm there, I do that. It's in transition that you do, because when you get there, it's just you got to hit the ground running, and we'll see that in Elisha. you got to get it done. Are you with me? So far, we've seen two things in transition. Number one, transition starts in your current place. Number two, the transition is not motionless. Number three, are you still with me today? Are you still awake? How to understand your transition. Transition will test your desire. A transition will test your desire. See, a transition will ask you, how bad do I want this? Am I convinced that this is the call of God for me? Is this the right job? Is this the right person? Isn't transition that you question your desire? Because once you're in it, you're in it. Once you're in it, you're in it. It's so important. This is why a lot of us as pastors, even with married couple, I know I'm talking about marriage, but um, we, we talk about the courtship stage, and also the premarital counseling, because that's when you can think, is this what I want? Is this where I'm heading? See, because once you're in it, we don't want you to get out of it. God doesn't want you to divorce. God doesn't desire your marriage to end in a rough way. He wants you to be successful. And that's why transitions are so important. So don't rush. Simply ask, is this what I want? Is this the right person? Is this the right job? Is this the right things I'm doing for my life? Because I'm going to learn something. I'm going to get something. The story gets really good. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. The story is about to take a turn. That's amazing. I love the story. Verse 2 starts saying like this. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. So they're on their way. They're heading. Elisha killed the oxen, left with Elijah. They're on their way. Elisha says, um, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me unto Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. You getting this? Elijah gets a word from God, says, go to Bethel. Elisha says, hey, you know what? Eli Elijah says to Elisha, stay here. The word is for me. I'm going to go. Elisha says, uh-uh. I'm going to go with you. Wherever you go, I'll go. Okay. So they head down. Verse number three. Now the sons of the prophets, let me explain, explain that expression. Sons of the prophets were schools of prophets in different towns. So it's like saying the school of mechanics, the school of dentistry, the school of medicine. The sons of the prophets were the guys who had a prophetic calling on them, and they would go to school to be trained by Elijah or other prophets of the time to learn prophecy. So that's who they are. This is the school of Bethel. So this is important to the story. Who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from, from over you today? Now you need to understand that all these guys know prophecy. Are you with me? So they knew that Elijah was going to die, that Elijah was going to be taken away from God and someone else was going to get the job. Are you following the story? So they say, Hey, do you know that, um, you know, that he's gone? Again, this story is crazy. Elisha says, and he said, yes, I know, keep silent. Yes, I know, keep silent. He knows. I have a, my sister-in-law, I hope she's not watching the line, but my sister-in-law, I love her to death. She's awesome, but she's really smart and really sharp. She's got, she has this expression. When you try to tell her something and she knows, she'll interrupt you halfway and say, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Like, don't tell me anymore, I already know. That's Elisha, man. He's like, hey, man, you know, shut up, shut up, shut up. I already know. Just. <laughs> Story continues. Verse number four, then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here. They went from one town to another town. Stay here, man. Please, for the Lord has sent me unto Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. I mean, if you understand something, he's making the job really hard. This is what you would call a test. And a lot of people miss it because they don't read it as a test. See, if you, were, you or I, we would think, man, Elijah's being a punk to this poor guy. He gave him a job, now doesn't want to hang out with him, doesn't want to train him, doesn't want to do anything with the guy. Elijah's saying, hey, I'm going. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. So they get to Jericho. 
Now the sons of prophets, these are not the same guys, this is a different school. The sons of prophets who were at Jericho came to Elijah, to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Does that sound familiar? So he answered, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. He didn't answer that. <laughs> so he answered, yes, I know, keep silent. Yes, I know, keep silent. Man, I mean, this guy is so focused, so determined. I'm going to get what God wants for me. I'm going to work at it. I'm going to keep going at it. I'm going to keep going at it. Why? Because transition will test your desire. His desire were being tested. Do you really want this? Do you really want this? So he said, hey, keep silent. I already know. So verse number six says, um, then Elijah said to him, stay here one more time. Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me unto the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and now your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. So here you see a pattern. He's saying, stay here. He keeps getting tested. He's saying, no, I'm going to go. Now watch this. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Is that intimidating or what? Now, before this says the school of prophets, sons of the prophets, a few guys maybe said, hey, your Lord's going to be taken. Keep silent, man. Hey, in Jericho, it's going to be taken. Now in this town, 50 of them, 50. It almost feels like like a street fight. Many of you guys may have seen gangs, but if you cross certain streets, the guys are going to line up, okay? It's the same thing. They're all lined up. They're saying, if you cross there, you're in trouble, man. This is Elijah. This is the greatest prophet. Who are you? And Elijah is saying, keep silent. I got this. I got this. I'm going to follow him because I want something from him to do this. You have to determine what you want from your transition. You have to determine what you want from your transition. If you keep reading, you will see that once they cross, they have a conversation. And Elisha is Elisha who has the plan and says, Elijah says, man, you've been following me all this time. I basically was trying to get away from you because God is going to take me away in a very miraculous way. Elijah already knew. And Elisha said, okay, cool. So here's what I want. I want twice of what you have. It was his idea. So this whole time in transition, he's thinking, what do I want from this guy? What do I want from this guy? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? When it was a moment, he asked. Many people don't know what they want. Their moment arrives. Hey, what do you want? Oh, man, I haven't really thought about it. Well, you know, what have you been doing this whole time? <laughs> That's what transition is for. Think it through. Process it in your heart. Process it in your head and say, when I get there, this is what I want. This is what I want in my life. This is what I need. Very important that you do that process. Elisha, it was Elisha's idea, said, I want a double portion. Elijah said, okay, if your eyes can see me when I'm taken, it's all yours, man. And that's exactly how it happened. So these 50 guys that are across the river are watching this whole thing. Elijah goes up in the sky, and then that brings us to point number four of tonight. Point number four, God empowers you in the transition. God empowers you in the transition. God empowers you. Let me repeat the three points so far. Transition starts in your current place. Transition is not motionless. Transition will test your desire. But number four and very important is that God empowers you in transition. It is in that moment of transition that the power of God will come upon you to do what he's asking you to do. He did it with the church. When the church came along, he didn't send the church. He said, you stay. This is transition. You stay. You pray. You fast. You wait. Because when the spirit of God comes upon you, power will be on you. And that was transition. They waited, they waited, they waited. It came, bam, they had the power to do exactly what God had asked them to do. See, God will empower you in your transition. It is in that moment that what you're desiring will come to your life. It'll grow. It'll grow. It'll double. It'll double in your life. Very important that you understand that. See, Elijah is empowered by God in the transition. Read with me 2 Kings 2, 14 to 15. It says... Then he took the mantle. So what happened is Elijah goes up and his mantle still there. The mantle that represents the prophet said, and Elijah that had fallen from him, he took the mantle that had fallen from Elijah 
and struck the water, and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? So here's Elisha. He doesn't even know what to call God. He's so new at the job, he doesn't even know what he's doing. He just knows that guy gave me his job, and he used to talk to a guy named God. So I'm going to get this and say, where is that guy? Are you following me? See, many people think, I have to be fully prepared. Oh, no. You don't have to be fully prepared, but you have to be fully committed. Two different things. Not necessarily fully prepared, but yes, fully committed. Fully committed. It's so important that you know that because Elisha was fully committed. There was no doubt in his mind. This is what he was going to do. This is what he wanted to do. And so he did it. So he takes and says, where is the God? <clears throat> where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he also has struck the water and the water divided this way and that way. And Elisha crossed over. This is my favorite verse. Verse 15. Now when the sons of the prophets, the 50 guys are on the other side who were from Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Listen to me. When the spirit of God is upon you, even your detractors will see the God in you. Even your detractors will see the God in you. Very important. It's so important that you understand this because God has a plan for you, but you got to stick with the plan. I remember... I don't know if I share this story here. I've told in several places, especially in Iglesia La Roca. Um, when I worked in the dental field, I was a supervisor. So in this company, it was mostly women in, in the back office of the dental field. And uh, I remember there was this one particular lady that had it out against me because she thought I was being mean to her and, um, you know, and all these things. And, and so, you know, it just went on. I remember one morning walking into work, and she had put a meeting together in the office. They called the owner of the company who was on the phone. I didn't know anything. I'm just walking in, clock in. I don't find anybody. I'm like, wait, where's everybody? Everybody's supposed to be clocking in by now, you know? And so they call me. Oh, they're in the office. And so this big old coup and everybody and telling the boss, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So fine. They get out of the office. I'm on the phone with the owner of the company. And, and so, you know, we're talking. And I, I told him, I said, look, I haven't done any of those things. You know, I do one thing. I said, I, I stick to protocol. I, you know, when equality, we're dealing with blood. We're dealing with all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, it's, you don't want to get sued is what I told them. So let me do my job. I'm doing my job. I know I'm doing the right thing. Um, and I remember I told my wife, I got home, you know, man, when you get home and you had a bad day, I mean, I just unloaded, you know, and just telling her I'm so mad. This I remember my wife's answer, which Usually doesn't calm a man. It takes a while for you to get there. But she said, let's pray. What? I wanted to get in the car. I thought she was going to say, let's get in the car. Let's go find that woman. <laughs> Too spiritual, you know. So, so we did. We did. She, she was so committed to prayer. And she would pray and pray for me. And I would pray. And, and I remember... One day, out of the blue, I get to the office. This lady was gunning for me. I found out from the other girls, oh, you know what's going on? She really wants her job. She wants you to get fired to get your position. I said, well, that's fine. She can have it. I, I really didn't care at the time. I was like, I don't want to struggle anymore. And I remember I came in several weeks, if not months, came by. And I remember I came one day, and she had put in her two weeks. And didn't even last the two weeks. I called my wife on the phone, you would not believe what happened. She quit and she left the company and all this stuff. And I remember from there on, my time in that company was absolutely amazing. I mean, the boss loved me, gave me races I never asked for. Uh, we had a great uh, team that we had a, whoa, sorry. We had a great team dynamic and a great development. It was so amazing. So what I'm telling you is that when you put things in God's hands, even in the process of transition, even your enemies are going to line up. As a matter of fact, here's what Proverbs said. Put it up for me. Proverbs says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Do you, did you, let's read it together because you're not convinced. One, two, three. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Even your enemies will be there. Are you having a hard time? This is the transition moment where you pray, where you ask. Elisha did his job. Those 50 guys that were looking at me like, what are you doing? 
Elijah said, look at me. Now I have the authority of God. And they recognized it immediately. said, this guy has the spirit of Elijah on him. And if you go on to read the life of Elijah, he did exactly, if I'm not mistaken, double, if not more, than any of the miracles that Elijah did. He did receive a great calling. He did amazing things for God. But everything happened because he understood his transition. What is your transition today? What is your transition? Are you moving on to a new job? Are you wanting a different house, different life? What is your transition? Are you planning on getting married? Are you questioning certain things in your life? A medical treatment that you need God to lead you and guide you. What is your transition? Whatever transition you need, you need to ask, you understand this. It will always start right where you're at. Not in the next level up, right where you're at. It will always, it is not, sorry, motionless. Don't stay sitting down waiting for it to happen. Make it happen through the, through the grace of God. Number three, transition will test your desire. This is when you really ask yourself, do I want it? Do I need it? Is it the right person? Is it the right job? Is it the right thing for me to do? And number four, God empowers you in the process of transition. It is through God's grace and his power and authority that we're going to be able to do what he's asking us to do. If God spoke to you, give him a hand tonight. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Give me five minutes more of your time, and I want to make sure that you're okay with God. And I, and I want to ask that if you would remain seated, the ushers are doing their job. But those five minutes are so crucial. They're important because it talks about a transition. We've talked about transitions tonight, but there is one transition that is so important and that you have to ask yourself about it. Here's a transition. If you were to die today, would you open your eyes in heaven or in hell? See, many people don't think about that transition. I want you to answer in your heart. If you say, wow, I, I, you know, I haven't given much thought. I mean, I, I'm young. I, life is awesome. And I'm not sick, so, so why think about that transition in life? Well, it comes at you in ways that you don't expect it, and at times that you're not wanting. That's just the reality of life. Death is inevitable. All of us in this room at some point will have to face that particular transition in our life. It depends how ready you are in the transition. And this message is so crucial for you and I to understand exactly what I'm about to tell you and what you need to ask yourself tonight about the transition in your life. See, many people would say, Pastor, uh, I, I'm, I'm set there. I'm good. I, there's no problem for me in that transition. But why would people say that? Why would people say, say that they're okay in their process of life? Most people, most people, when asked this question, say, of course, I mean, I'm going to go to heaven. God is a good God. Who doesn't go to heaven? I mean, I can think maybe people that are locked up in jail, maybe that's the qualification to, to not go to heaven. But that is not the truth. That is not the truth. It has nothing to do whether you're locked up or outside. Zero. It has to do with the condition of your heart. It has to do with the condition of your soul in this moment, in this hour, in this time. And that's why we ask you the question, what is the condition of your soul this very day? You would say, Pastor, I'm a good person. I, I don't do bad things. I, you know, I don't get in trouble. I, I am a good, generally a social good person. No one in the Bible says that a social good person makes it into heaven. That is a concept that's part of our world, part of our society. We say, oh, good people, hey, they go to heaven. Why not? Not written in the Bible. Nowhere. So why would people assume that God, listen to this, listen to this, that God would send his only son, only son to die on a cross for you, a terrible, bloody death, absolutely horrific, so that you or I or society can decide who gets to heaven? That sounds crazy. See, the reality is this. God wants a commitment for you just like we talked in the transition. This is the question where you ask yourself, what do I want to do with my transition in life? How would you ask yourself this question? Listen to this. This is the condition of your soul. I will describe it in a minute. The Bible says that Jesus says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What is he saying? He's saying, listen to me and listen clear to what I'm saying. I want you in or I want you out, but I don't want you in the middle. What's a lukewarm person? A person that maybe comes to church and said, man, I'm in trouble. I need God to solve my problem. After the problem is solved, they don't talk to God, see God, visit God till the next problem comes. That's a warm, that's a lukewarm person. 
A lukewarm person is that person who says, well, you know, I, I'm kind of there, but I'm not really there. Uh, I, sometimes I do this. I, if somebody asks me I'm a Christian, I usually try to hide it. You're not convinced in your transition and in your decision. God is saying, you got to make a choice. I rather, the verse says, I rather you be hot or cold. You know what God is saying? I rather you're not in this at all than to be in it halfway. Because God doesn't deal in half terms. Jesus didn't say, let me just die half and then I'll bring salvation. It was a complete death. Are you hearing me? It was complete. God doesn't deal in half truth. Neither will he do it with you. So here's the decision. Here's what you got to do. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So it's only through Jesus that you can have a connection with God. And in a moment, we're going to do that. How are we going to do that? This is what I want from you and what the Bible wants from you. In a moment, if you're saying, Pastor, you've described me. Pastor, I, my life with God is not right. I need to make the transition tonight. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. When you hear one, two, three, you raise your hand right away. Why do you need to raise your hand? Listen, you need to do it because the Bible says, the Bible says, if you acknowledge me before man, I'm a man, I'll see your hand, we all will probably, if you acknowledge me, I will acknowledge you before my Father. You know what Jesus is going to do? Hey, God, he raised his hand. She did it too. She did it too. That's awesome. But in that same verse says, if you deny me, I will deny you. God is not playing games. He wants a commitment, but he's willing to be with you in that process. And you need God today. You're saying to yourself, Pastor, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Here's the process. Here's a transition to get out from when you're at and to get on to God. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. Who should raise your hand? If you've never done this, if you never asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior and forgive you of your sins, this is your moment. If you did it at one point, but what you said with your mouth was not what you lived out with your life, there was no true commitment, redo it today. Rededicate your life, reaffirm it once again. Who should raise your hand? That person sitting right there saying, you're talking to me. I need to change tonight. I need to make that decision. This is your moment. I count to three. You raise your hand, and we'll pray together right here, right now. Don't be embarrassed. All of us here, we're going to clap for you, cheer you on, because we love you. We're not going to laugh at you. We want to encourage you. So take courage in your heart. One, two, and three. Is there anyone here? God bless you. One, two, thank you. Three, four, five. Great. Anyone else? Six. Thank you. Seven. Is there anyone else? Didn't embarrass them? Eight. Thank you. I see your hand. Put it down. Didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. All we want from you is a commitment saying, Pastor, I want to do that. See, if you raise your hand today, Jesus is saying, they did it. They did it. They see, he sees you. He's celebrating you. This is your turn. Is there anyone else struggling? You're sitting there saying, Man, I want to do this, but I'm afraid. I, I don't know if I do it. This is your moment. Be brave and raise your hand and get it done and do it and say, God, I'm committing tonight. That's what I'm doing. I'm rededicating my life. You know God is speaking to you. There's eight wise people. I know there's more. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? Nobody can force you to do this. This is your own decision. Is there anyone else tonight? God bless you. Thank you. Nine. I want to wait a little longer just because the Spirit of God is asking me to do so. Would you be patient with me? Is there anyone else tonight? I'm, I'm holding everything. I'm done humanly, but God is giving you a chance. Is there anyone else tonight that needs to secure their life with God? This is your moment. This is your moment with God. I'll ask it one more time. Is there anyone else tonight? Raise your hand and we'll pray together. This is your turn. All right. I can't force you, but I know you're out there. Those nine, I think nine or ten that raised your hand, here's what I want to do. If you raise your hand tonight, I want to pray with you personally, and I want to get some material in your hand. We're so excited. Here's what I want you to do. Grab your coat, sweater, Bible, whatever you have with you. If you need somebody to come with you, say, hey, come with me. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. We're going to pray with you. You don't give your heart to Jesus by raising your hand. 
you will do it by asking me and inviting him in your heart. And that's what you're going to do. So if you raise your hand, and if you didn't, but you know you should have, when they get up, all of us, let's stand up, and you come up front, and we'll pray together in a moment. Come on, give them a hand. If you raise your hand, go ahead and come up front, and we'll pray together. Thank you, Lord. your hand but you want to do it you want to come this is your moment thank you this is your moment you're saying yes to God thank you thank you awesome thank you let you guys are up front you guys are amazing you guys have taken such an important step. We've all done it at some point and never regretted it. But I want you to do something for me. I want you to give me two more minutes, okay? Because the Spirit is asking me to wait just a little longer for a few more people, okay? Two more minutes. I am, God is asking you to do this, just like they did. We didn't embarrass them. We're not going to embarrass you. But I'm not going to force you. If you know who you are, get yourself down here before we go to pray. Right now, Elijah's going to sing that song one more time. If that's you, you walk over here. Go ahead, Elijah. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment. I did my part. I was obedient to God. I'm excited about that. You did your part. You were obedient to God. You're excited about that. If you're out there, work your way with God because he's wanting you, okay? Listen, those are up front. Here's what I want to do. I want to send you with Pastor Dave. Now, Pastor Dave is an amazing man. He's going to do something. He's going to treat you right. He wants to, I'm going to explain it to you. He's going to pray with you. Why do you have to pray? The Bible says that you ask God to come into your heart. And if you say with belief in your heart, it'll come to pass. He'll explain that to you. He will also give you some material that will help you be strong. You do that decision, and you're going to be solid for God, okay? So go with Pastor Dave. He'll give you that information and pray with you. Thank you so much. Encourage them. Thank you so much. Amen. Give him a hand. Come on. It's worth it. Thank you, Lord.